I'm delighted to be joined by the former Chancellor, a very distinguished colleague of mine in the House of Commons, Kwasi Kwarteng. Kwasi, thank Hi, you very you. much. Good to for see you, Jacob. Me. You had the legal obligation, as did yeah, I briefly, did, yes. for net zero. That's right. It now seems to be trumping our moral compass. No, How do no. we justify that? So I think that your perception of net zero is wrong because it's a huge industrial opportunity. You uh, succeeded me in Bayes, in the department that was responsible for it. And you will know that a lot of our um, levelling up agenda, a lot of our industrial agenda was driven by this thing that's called the energy transition. And very lastly, on my first uh, uh, remarks on this, if we were to say we're not going to do any net zero, the Germans, the Americans with their IRA Act, uh, the, uh, the Chinese even, I mean, we, talk, we can talk about China, they're all industrialising in a way that's going away from fossil fuels to, to renewable energy. But one of the things I was really struck by in Bayes was that we were putting charges on our high energy users, particularly our steel sector, that's right. that was essentially forcing it out of business, and then importing steel made in China that didn't suffer from these regulations. This was net zero making the UK yeah, so economy poorer. Look, so I think there are some policy areas where we've done some silly things. Um, and I always used to have, uh, when I was in Bayes, a debates with the Treasury about this, that we were, we were, we were literally putting uh, charges on our industry and making them uncompetitive, as you say. But that doesn't mean that the overall strategy of net zero is the wrong one. And I saw it uh, in offshore wind. I mean, if you, you know, when we entered the House of Commons in 2010, 40% of electricity was generated by coal burning. Today, that's about 2%. Um, so we've already decarbonized, and the Chinese are doing but, the same thing. I mean, when I was in Bayes, we were, we were the leaders in offshore wind, and today the Chinese are the leaders because they're, they're building more offshore wind. But you say by moving from 40% coal power generation, we have decarbonized. We are decarbonizing. We are yeah. ahead of the rest of yes, the world. Yes, we are. Um, in the Yale study, I think we're second sure, behind right. Denmark. Why are we going ahead further and faster than everybody else when we're putting costs on our economy and other people aren't because, putting the costs on our economy? Because there is a huge prize here. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm reminded of the debates about Industrial Revolution and the Luddites. I'm not suggesting you're a Luddite, of course, but I am saying that there is a huge industrial opportunity. And if we're at the, the forefront of it, we've got to stay at the forefront of it. There's no point saying, oh, well, we're second, wait, we can hang back and, you're and not advance. You're a very distinguished historian. You've written a couple of excellent <laughs> Thank books. You. Thank you. Thank you. And so if we talk about the Luddites, the Luddites were opposing the free market producing solutions that made they were, the economy more efficient. Yeah. What I'm opposing is government subsidy, government regulation, that dreadful Energy Act we passed last week, <laughs> which is nothing but cost on consumers. So, so what the Luddite, where you are perhaps uh, resembling the Luddites in my view, is that they, it was new technology essentially that they were, they were opposing. And I think that the net zero, the, the, the offshore wind farm, all of that. I'm all in favour of new technology. technology. I'm, that's not in favor, going to I'm not in favour of our industrial culture. That we're doing this through subsidy and regulation, not through allowing competition between competing. So it's a bit competing. of both. So you have to, you have to, and you'll appreciate this. That there is a sort of um, infant industry argument, where in order to sort of kickstart industry, you do have to support, uh, in many instances. Uh, uh, industries. They don't just emerge. I mean, sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. But the and government's think, record of picking winners is very... Yeah, poor. I agree. I agree. So, so, so what, it's, it's a fine line you've got to, you've got to draw between giving uh, the beginning of an industry some support. That's why we're at the head of offshore wind. That didn't just happen uh, by the force of the invisible hand. But at the same time, you've got to crowd in private investment. And that's what we were doing in the department that you and I ran. On the issue of China and net zero... Um, is it reasonable to say that we must have a good relationship with China because of net zero when it is behaving as it is? To so I Uyghurs? wouldn't have put it like that. OK, how would you I, put so it? So my own view on China is that we've got to engage with them, whether that's through trade or diplomacy. We can't simply draw the, 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 the drawbridge up and say, we're not going to talk to you, we're not going to engage with you because of all the terrible things you're doing. That, to, to me, seems counter. But in what, in what way do we do that? Because... Um, the relationship we had with the Soviet Union hmm. in the 70s and 80s was one where there was some engagement. There was. But that we weren't welcoming them to every event that we were holding. No. And we treated them very cautiously, but the Germans, particularly in technology transfer. And it's, it's How would you it's, handle it, that? But it's, it's, you know, contrary to common belief, there was quite a lot of economic engagement, particularly on, and, the, and, side, and the, on the gas and, and, and all of that. that was, they were quite well um, sort of uh, connected. 
uh, Western Germany with, with the Soviet uh, but, economic regime. But should that be the model? Should we be so, treating China in the way we did the Soviet Union at that point? Uh, I, think, I think that's a fair analogy, but at the same time, China's role in the global economy is vast. And I think we would be shooting ourselves in the foot um, to say that we're not engaging with you, uh, China, under any circumstances. And from a personal point of view, I remember in, in 2015, we, we were essentially rolling the red carpet out to China. Um, and, you know, President Xi went to that pub in Oxfordshire, I can't remember which one it was, with, with our prime minister. And at the time, and we were both backbenchers, I was seen as a China hawk. Uh, and now people think I'm a China dove. My views haven't changed. It's just that the, whole, the, the, the kind of the perception of China has gone through 100 degrees. But hasn't degrees. the behaviour of China changed? I Wasn't think China pre much. Xi Jinping much more um, in line with international norms, and it's moved away from that? I think we overdo that. I okay. think, I think they, they, they're much more consistent. I mean, they think in much longer terms uh, than we do. And I think they've had a... I mean, you've, you lived in Hong Kong, and you, I was very surprised to see... I was in Hong Kong about a month ago. I hadn't been there for 18 years. Completely different. Completely different. Um, and they've got a strategy. Well, we're going to have to have another conversation on China. Kwasi, thank you so thank much you. for coming in.